Good afternoon um, in Amherst, good morning uh, in California, and good day wherever anybody else might happen to be. Um, welcome to our final 2020-21 um, talk in the UMass School of Public Policy um, Public Engagement and Outreach Committee um, talks for this year. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. I know we have a lot of registrants, and I also know that um, that there's a lot going on, especially for UMass public policy students who who are who have a lot of deadlines this week. So um, we're you know we're, we're a great crowd, and we we would probably be even a better crowd if not for the diligence of our, our students um, at the moment. I'm David Mednikoff. Again, I'm chair of this committee and a um, a professor in the public policy uh, school at UMass, as well as chair of the Judaic and Near Eastern Studies Department at UMass Amherst. Uh, and it's been my privilege to be the chair of um, this committee and to host just these wonderful speakers. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to bruise the other, the earlier speakers' uh, egos by saying we've saved the best for last, but I'm really delighted um, that we indeed have a fantastic. Um, an extremely timely um, final speaker in, in you know this year's uh, set of talks that uh, I, I hope have felt to all of you as we've meant them to be to really engage critical issues of you know current um, social justice um, that I think are you know are meaningful to us and are really on on the kind of national and international agenda and nothing could be truer of an issue. Um, like that um, than in, in environmental justice, um, which our speaker today, Dr. Nikki Sheets, has been working on for his whole career. Um, so I'm, you know, particularly delighted that um, Dr. Sheets agreed to to come exactly at a moment that there's so much public change and 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 um, and visibility around. Um, climate change issues, most notably, obviously, the Biden administration summit, which I'm sure many of you paid attention to at the end of last week, and which is, um, you know, seems to have helped uh, a number of countries up their uh, carbon emissions targets, including the United States. So this is a really great moment. Um, and as always, um, our speaker will uh, will leave time to address questions, comments on, on issues related to his talk or related to, you know, this topic of environmental justice generally. So I'm really looking forward to your connections to this um, and certainly and especially to what our speaker has to say. Um, I also, again, want to give a welcome to students and faculty from our uh, from our partner institute, uh, institution of uh, UC Riverside School of Public Policy and, you know, anybody else who's uh, as well as our community members, um, but anybody you know from outside who's who's joining us, and hopefully next year we'll also have a robust and exciting roster, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Okay, let me say something about um, Dr. Sheets before um, I then turn things over to him. Dr. Nikki Sheets Esquire is the director of the Center for the of the for the Urban Environment of the John S. Watson Institute for Urban Policy and Research at Keene University. New Jersey, and has defined the primary mission of the center as providing support for the environmental justice community. Among the issues he works on are air pollution, climate change, cumulative impacts, developing EJ legal strategies, and increasing the working capacity of the EJ community. Dr. Sheets was a founding member of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, the EJ Leadership Forum, the EJ and Science Initiative, and an informal New England a Northeast, sorry, um, EJ Attorneys Group. He has been appointed to the New Jersey Clean Air Council, the EPA's Clean Air Act Advisory Committee, and the Nash and its National EJ Advisory Council. And he's a co-author of the Human Health Chapter of the 2014 National Climate Assessment. He recently was appointed to and is currently serving on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. So he, you know, knows he has his finger to the pulse of a lot of stuff going on. Um, he pub he practiced law as a public interest attorney early in his career, and um, he he holds a BA from Princeton University and um, earned a PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences, a JD, and a Master's in Public Policy from Harvard. Um, 
and I'm, I'm sorry that uh, having actually spent a lot of time in the same places around the same time that this is my first chance to actually meet him, but I'm delighted and looking forward to really hearing what um, Dr. Sheets has to say. And with that, please welcome Dr. Sheets, um, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, David. Let's see if we can get my PowerPoint up. I'm running. There we go. Can uh, can everybody see that and hear me? Yep. Thumbs up. Okay. So, well, let me start my timer. So, uh, let me start off by um, saying I'm very glad to be speaking to you, and I want to thank uh, Mo Turner and David Mendikoff and Michael Ash for inviting me to speak and for arranging the event. Um, I should also point out that I'm uh, also, in addition to representing the uh, Washington Institute for Public for Urban Policy and Research, recent name change, by the way, um, also representing the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance in this talk. And I wanted to start out by giving you a little bit of an idea of, of what I do and, and um, the main purpose here is I just, I just wanna have transparency. Uh, I'm not neutral. I come from these is issues from the inside of the EJ community. Uh, so a large part of what I do is tr I try to help the EJ, EJ for environmental justice, right? EJ community uh, develop the best possible public policy from an environmental justice point of view. So I use my science and legal background um, to help do this. I do a lot of writing. Uh, most of it is not um, academic. I, I do write some, some academic pieces. Uh, hopefully, we just finished, just finished once. So hopefully, uh, once that's in shape, we'll get it published. But um, a lot of the writing I do are comments on um, laws or regulations and reports and position papers, uh, grant proposals. And um, I also help build the capacity of the EJ movement. I'm a member of a lot of organizations and, and, and that's code for helping those organizations to survive. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's start by doing some uh, EJ 101 uh, in case, cause I don't know what the backgrounds of folks are. So it doesn't hurt to start with the basics. Uh, it's often said that the environmental justice movement is at the intersection of the civil rights and environmental movements. Um, and a couple of comments about that. The um, EJ movement, and there is a, a grassroots, uh, national grassroots environmental justice movement. Uh, we kind of literally bring the, we bring color, people of color to environmental issues. Um, most of the EJ movement are people of color, although we're well integrated because uh, low income white communities are part of the EJ movement. Um, also, uh, but most of us people of color, smaller organizations, talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And one of the directors for the New Jersey EJ Alliance used to always say, he would see this slide and he would say, Nikki, uh, uh, he's, he's, he's African-American. He said, Nikki, uh, we're at the intersection of the black power movement and environmental movements. But that is a, that is a different presentation. Um, Cutting it down to basics, the EJ movement is concerned with the disproportionate burden of pollution you often find in communities of color and low-income communities. And you hear me refer to these uh, communities as EJ communities, environmental justice communities. So we want to address that disproportionate pollution burden. We want to make sure that residents of these communities are involved in decisions that affect their communities, uh, particularly um, environmental decisions. And we want to make sure that these communities have access to benefits produced by improving the environment. Now, environmental justice now has branched out into a lot of areas. Um, and we, we, most of us consider them part of environmental justice, transportation justice, food justice, climate justice. Most of us consider all of those part of environmental justice. And uh, as I said, there is a grassroots um, EJ movement, uh, the organizations you see there in coalitions are all organizations that I'm part of. Some of them are not functioning at the moment, a couple or a couple are, are not. Um, but most of them are, most of them are regional and national. 
my home organization is the New Jersey EJ Alliance, where I, I do um, most of my work. Um, and let me just do a little bit about the EJ movement and the environmental movement. And the two movements are almost like a family. And that is to say, we're fairly dysfunctional. Uh, we work together a lot of times, but we also fight together and fight each other uh, a, a lot of times. Um, and in particular, though, what's important about this presentation is that I think the movements at their core have different purposes. The environmental justice movement, uh, its main purpose is to protect communities. Now, the EJ movement is concerned about the physical environment, but its main purpose is to protect communities. On the other hand, I would argue that the main purpose of the environmental movement is to protect the physical environment. Now, the environmental movement is concerned about communities, but its main purpose is to protect the physical environment. And because the main purposes are, are different, sometimes we're pushed to different policy positions. And I'm gonna talk about one of those policy positions today, a very important one, and that is climate change mitigation policy, where we do have differences. So let me jump to the substantive topic by showing you two figures that I've shown all over the country that I pretty much show every time I talk. Um, uh, I'm either infamous or famous for showing them, whichever one you want, want to say. And I show them so much my EJ colleagues tease me about them, uh, but I, I don't care. I'm happy to have a relatively new audience to show them to. Although I think uh, Michael, I should apologize to Michael Ash. He may have seen this when I talked years ago at UMass um, Amherst, but he's probably forgotten about it by now. So, these figures show the relationship between cumulative impacts, race, and income in New Jersey. For the purposes of these figures, you can think of cumulative impacts as a very rough estimate of the total amount of pollution uh, in New Jersey neighborhoods. So they were developed by uh, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, not as I'd like to say by us, by us crazy EJ folks, but New Jersey DEP developed, them, developed these figures in 2009 using data from the late 1990s and early 2000s. And the first thing they did was they assigned a relative cumulative impact score to every neighborhood in New Jersey. And then they asked the question, well, what's the relationship between race and income and cumulative impacts? The estimate of the total amount of pollution in New Jersey neighborhoods. So they graphed it. And you see the relationships that, that it shows. Depend, depending on how I feel that day, I, I'll say it's a uh, very, troubling relationship, disturbing relationship. Sometimes I'll even say unholy relationship. Um, look at the top figure. It shows you that, that as the number of people of color living in New Jersey neighborhoods increases, so does the amount of cumulative impacts and, uh, or the estimate of the amount of cumulative impacts. And look at the bottom figure. It shows the same relationship for people living in poverty. As low income uh, residents in New Jersey neighborhoods increases, so does the um, estimated amount of pollution in New Jersey neighborhoods. So I'll say what I've said to audiences all over the country. What this is providing evidence of is that if you live in New Jersey, the amount of pollution in your neighborhood, or at least the estimated amount, is connected to race and income, the color of your skin and the amount of money in your pocket. And that goes against everything that New Jersey and the country at least profess to stand for when it comes to justice and equity. Um, and this really shows why the, the environmental justice movement exists, why many of us are, um, are part of it. And I should add that uh, if similar studies, that this is not just a New Jersey phenomenon, of course, if similar studies were performed in Massachusetts, and actually one was uh, performed in Massachusetts, uh, you'll have similar findings. And I think similar, there were similar findings in Massachusetts. And in fact, one thing that started the EJ movement back in the late 1980s was um, were our reports, national reports that had similar findings. So in New Jersey, you know, we, we knew about this relationship, the EJ community did before the figures were developed and released. Um, and it just confirmed what we already knew. And we decided that we had to develop um, policies to address the disproportionate amount of pollution that you see estimated in environmental justice figures. Well, one reason I like these figures is because even though the EJ neighborhoods are not labeled, 
you can see them clearly on the right of your screen, right? Those are the environmental justice communities, communities of color, low-income communities. Um, they give you a marker, uh, Newark, the largest city in New Jersey is about 88% of color, I believe. So it would be way over to your right. And you see that there's a disproportionate amount of pollution that's estimated to be in the environmental justice communities. So uh, we developed, and many people, you know, a lot of EJ um, organizations are doing this, develop strategies to address this disproportionate uh, pollution burden. And I will argue to you that I think there are two rough categories of, of policies that need to be developed to address this disproportionate pollution burden. One will address the burden by addressing the concept of cumulative impacts directly. Right? So there'll be laws to address cumulative impacts. And in fact, in New Jersey, we, we have such a law, a landmark cumulative impacts law that was adopted in late, late last August. But there will be other, uh, uh, the other category of laws and strategies will be strategies that address portions and uh, of the uh, and types of, the, of pollution that go into making up the disproportionate pollution burden. And that's what I'm gonna talk about mostly today. One type of um, environmental policy that the EJ community has been arguing for years should be, should be used to address the disproportionate polluting burden is climate change mitigation policy. So let's talk climate change mitigation policy for the next 24 minutes. Um, so this crowd probably knows, everyone in the crowd probably knows, but uh, no problem to say it again, that when we talk about climate change mitigation policy, we're talking about fighting climate change uh, by reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, usually we're talking about carbon dioxide. But from an EJ perspective, what we want from climate change mitigation policy is not only for it to fight climate change, but also to produce emissions reductions in EJ communities. That's the basic premise. And there's a more detailed premise for you, the top bullet point. Uh, so what we want from the EJ perspective, what we want from Part of what we want from climate change mitigation policy, well, let me just read the, uh, that paragraph to you. Guaranteed emissions reductions in and near EJ communities, preferably with greenhouse gas co-pollutant reductions intentionally maximized, but reductions either way. So look, this is what I wanna get across to you. Under, if you understand that, you understand the talk, I could stop talking, but um, I like to talk, so I'll continue on. But so let's pull apart the paragraph clause by clause. And let me try to explain what we mean by it. So the first clause, guaranteed emissions reductions in and near EJ communities. Well, you know what the EJ community is. I refer to it, communities of color, low income communities. Guaranteed emissions reductions. Well, why do we even say that from climate change mitigation policy? Because isn't climate change mitigation policy all about getting emissions reductions? The answer is yes. But as I'll uh, talk about in a minute, not all types of climate change mitigation policy, policies uh, guarantee you're gonna get reductions in all facilities in all places. So the second clause, um, preferably with greenhouse gas copolite reductions intentionally maximized. Okay, we know what a greenhouse gas is. Usually we're talking about carbon dioxide, but what's a greenhouse gas copolite? Um, think of a power plant. A power plant not only emits carbon dioxide, but it also emits other air pollutants along with the carbon dioxide. And these other air pollutants in the lexicon of climate change mitigation policy are called green, greenhouse gas co-pollutants. And there are important distinctions between greenhouse gases and these other pollutants. Uh, you often hear the carbon dioxide is called a global pollutant. And uh, one reason is that it's thought that in, in, in order to fight climate change anyway, it doesn't matter where you get reductions of carbon dioxide. It doesn't matter geographically where you get reductions. And also it's thought that the carbon dioxide does not hurt you directly. The carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere anyway cause climate change and climate change hurts you. Now the other pollutants, the coal pollutants emitted along with carbon dioxide are different. They are um, pollutants like um, fine particulate matter and they do harm you directly. 
and they do have locally detrimental uh, public health impacts. And they are part of, uh, they go into composing uh, the disproportionate pollution burden that you saw in the previous, um, in the previous figures that I showed you. And what we really want from climate change mitigation policy from the EJ perspective is not only to fight climate change, but we wanna reduce emissions of these coal pollutants in EJ communities and other communities so we can make these communities healthier. So ideally, climate change mitigation policy would ideally from an EJ perspective, it would set a carbon dioxide reduction goal, right? Emission reduction goal, say 10%. And then it would develop strategies to achieve this carbon dioxide reduction goal, while at the same time maximizing the reduction of these coal pollutants, right? Double bang for your buck. But no climate change mitigation policy that I know of does this. So we have said, well, we'll take the next best thing. If you're not going to, um, you know, intentionally maximize coal pollutant reduction, we'll take guaranteed emissions reductions of carbon dioxide in EJ communities. Because if we get that, we're going to get some incidental reduction of the coal pollutants. Because the carbon dioxide and coal polluted emission, emissions are correlated. So we'll take what we can get at this point. Now, you, we probably won't get as much reduction of the coal pollutants as if the strategy intends to maximize their reduction. But as I say, we'll take what we can get. So what we're saying here is we want plants that are under some type of climate change mitigation policy, any kind of climate change mitigation policy, we want them to be forced to reduce their emissions. Any plant located in an EJ community or whose um, emissions significantly impact uh, an EJ community should be forced to reduce their emissions. And here's a little bit more on coal pollutants. The um, coal pollutant that we usually care about the most is fine particulate matter. It's just what it sounds like. These are airborne particles. Um, and in this case, size does, does matter. Uh, these are airborne particles, all less than two and a half microns in diameter. That means they're small enough to get into your lungs and there they cause havoc. Uh, they cause death and uh, disease. And in the 2013 study uh, issued by MIT, by a, a research group at MIT, they found that in 2005, fine particulate matter caused um, 200,000 premature deaths in the United States, just fine particulate matter. And it's an EJ issue. I have a slide saying that somewhere because there is disproportionate exposure to air pollution um, by EJ communities, or EJ communities are disproportionately exposed to air pollution in the United States. So climate change mitigation policy presents us with an opportunity and actually a goal. From the easier perspective, the goal is to use climate change mitigation policy to drive down concentrations of fine particulate matter and other coal pollutants, and you saw them, like uh, nitrogen, nitrogen ox, uh, oxides, sulfur dioxide, hazardous air pollutants, to drive down constant ambient concentrations of these air pollutants um, to levels that we've not thus far been able to achieve. Um, so, Look, there are strategies and laws in place to address these coal pollutants that are already in place to address them. But what we want is the climate change mitigation policy to be used in conjunction with these existing strategies to drive down these concentrations as low as possible and to concentrate that we haven't been able to achieve, achieve so far. And it's important to note that what the science is telling us uh, especially when it comes to fine particulate matter, is that there's no lower ambient concentration of fine particulate matter. Ambient means the concentration of fine particulate matter in the air. There's no lower threshold of uh, uh, fine particulate matter concentration below which you won't get additional health benefits. I'll say that in English. The lower the concentration of fine particulate matter in the air, the better. There's national standards for these other coal pollutants. There's a national standard for fine particulate matter uh, related to its concentration in the air. Even if your state, they're done by state, meets that standard, fine particulate matter is still killing people and making people sick, especially in EJ communities where concentrations tend to be higher. And especially in EJ communities when you have more of these other pollutants that combine, remember the cumulative impacts, the total amount of pollution 
and we don't have a standard for that total amount of pollution. So if we use climate change mitigation policy in the way that the EJ community is suggesting, right, to attack that disproportionate pollution burden in EJ communities, it would start to save lives, climate change mitigation policy would start to save lives as soon as it was rolled out. You wouldn't have to wait for the next detrimental climate change event to happen, for the next severe storm, or you know, the, you know, the next heat wave. You wouldn't have to wait for them to make climate change mitigation policy uh, start to save lives. And look, I'm not making fun or making light of these uh, of the detrimental impacts of climate change, because uh, we in New Jersey, you know, know about that from from Superstorm Sandy. But again we could make climate change mitigation policy immediately relevant to EJ communities by using it in this way to address um, local air pollution. And so by making it immediately relevant to EJ communities, uh, you would be bringing communities into the climate change debate, low-income communities and communities of color. You probably bring them into a debate that oftentimes they're left out of. And you probably gain some additional political support for climate change mitigation policy by doing so. Uh, here's a slide I referred to earlier, really just shows that there's disproportionate pollution, uh, that, that EJ communities are disproportionately exposed to air pollution. I need to update my citations. You see a citation from one of your colleagues, uh, Michael Ash, James Boyce, um, that have done a lot of work in this area. Thank you for that work. Um, so look, I've stated the basic premise. From the EJ perspective, what we want from climate change mitigation policy is for it to fight disproportionate pollutant burdens in our communities, as well as fight climate change. So we want power plants that are subject to a climate change mitigation strategy. We want them to be forced to reduce their emissions in EJ communities, or if they're outside of EJ communities, if their emissions uh, significantly impact these communities. So, you know, um, that is, I think, a pretty straightforward idea. Uh, so what's the problem? Well, the problem from an EJ perspective is that I think it's fair to say the primary policy that's being used to fight climate change is called carbon trading. And it's, it's a, a market-based mechanism. Um, New Jersey and Massachusetts, by the way, are part of a carbon trading program in the Northeast called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, REGI for short. There's a carbon trading program in California. You're here referred to as AB32. And from an EJ perspective, the problem with carbon trading or a problem with carbon trading and other pure market-based climate change mitigation mechanisms um, is that they don't guarantee emissions reductions from all facilities at all locations. So for example, I won't get too heavy into this. You can ask me questions later. They'll say that New Jersey, um, uh, all the plants in New Jersey that are under the climate change mitigation policy, and there's something like 23 to 25 power plants in New Jersey are part of REGI, collectively, they have to meet a carbon dioxide reduction goal. But if the plant in Newark does not reduce its emissions and the overall goal is met by, the, by collectively by the plants, that's all right under climate change, under um, carbon trade. Um, but that's not all right from an EJ perspective. So in a way, and especially by the, you know, the manner in which we've defined, partially defined equity and environmental justice, or I have, um, as where emissions reductions occur, uh, you have what I, I think my EJ colleagues would say, I'm understating this. You have an, uh, a great irony in that the most important environmental policy that we will develop, most important, maybe second most important, um, in, uh, one of the most important environmental policy that we will develop as a society does not guarantee that you'll have a reduction of pollution in the communities with the most pollution. And from an EJ perspective, since usually the communities with the most pollution, the EJ communities, that's an issue. But let me be careful um, about what I'm saying here. 
I'm not saying the climate change mitigation policy will never deliver emissions reductions in EJ communities. Under climate, uh, un, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that carbon trading uh, will never deliver emissions reductions in EJ communities. Under carbon trading, three things can happen to emissions in EJ communities. They can be reduced, they can stay the same, or they can increase. Uh, two of those, from the EJ perspective, are not good. So under carbon trading, you'll always be left with these questions. How many EJ communities will receive reductions? Which EJ communities will receive reductions? What will be the extent or size of those reductions? And over what time period will they occur? Will they occur soon and not later, later and not soon, or you know, over a long time period? Those are questions that from an EJ perspective are, um, are unacceptable. So again, we presented what in concept is a simple pollute, uh, solution, from, a part solution from an EJ perspective, identify plants located in EJ communities, force them redu to reduce their emissions, even if they're part of a market-based mechanism, by the way, for market-based climate change mitigation policy, um, and force them to reduce their, pollute, their emissions. But we understand that implementation of this type of policy would not be so simple. There'll be a number of uh, questions to answer. And these are the simple ones, by the way. <laughs> you know, how do you define an EJ community? I loosely said there are communities of color, low-income communities. We need a more specific definition. How much should you reduce by? In a paper I've written that I'll uh, cite at the end of this talk, um, I suggested 25%. Uh, reduction, but that was just a starting point and really thrown out there to um, start discussion. And let me double down on some arguments here to support um, this policy suggestion. Uh, you've heard me say them before. One is that climate change mitigation policy, when used in conjunction with other policy that's now being used under the Clean Air Act, we're looking for additional reductions. Uh, a reduction is additional to the ones that have already been produced by existing strategies. And reductions have been produced, but EJ communities uh, still need more, as do some other communities. And, you know, I guess what I'm saying inherently or implicitly is that the Clean Air Act is not doing enough to protect EJ communities right now. We need to have additional protection. And I want to also make the point that we're not saying that this policy is a silver, silver bullet policy. So even if climate change mitigation policy is used in this way, we'll still need other policies developed to address the cumulative impacts, the total amount of pollution in environmental justice neighborhoods. And in fact, we started to say, we're gonna need cumulative policies to address cumulative impacts. Let me take a step back and I'm almost done and say that what I'm arguing to you in general is that um, EJ and equity should be an integral part of any climate change mitigation policy. And it should not be left to be addressed later. And we hear that a lot, by the way. It drives us up one wall and down the other. That, well, we'll put the climate change mitigation policy in place not now, i.e. the climate trading system, and we'll address equity later. We'll develop those programs later. And now we're saying no, no. Um, EJ and equity should be addressed upfront by any climate change mitigation policy. We're not accepting, the EJ community, people of color are not accepting this, um, we'll address it later. We probably don't have the political power to do anything about it, although we're trying, but we're gonna make it known that to us, that's unacceptable. And, more specifically, the market should not be making our EJ and equity decisions for us. The location of reductions, emissions reductions on the climate change mitigation policy should be planned and it should be intentional. In New Jersey, New Jersey's part of the Greenhouse Gas Initiative, as is Massachusetts. New Jersey was part of the original um, initiative. It was pulled out by uh, a Republican governor not for the reasons, <laughs> not for the reasons that I've laid out here. And then it was put back in by our um, recently elected Democratic government. The EJ community in New Jersey opposed New Jersey being part of Reggie. 
much of it was for the reasons that I've laid out here. Um, and then we said though, that if you're going to go into Reggie over the objections of the EJ community, at least incorporate this um, proposal that uh, I talked to you about today to make Reggie just a little bit um, more EJ friendly. Thus far, we have been ignored. Um, I want to say quickly that um, uh, even if, I want to make it clear that even if uh, a climate change mitigation policy included mandatory emissions reductions, you probably still wouldn't get pre-implementation support for carbon trading, although we'd probably have to take it back to the EJ committee and talk about it, because there are other issues connected to market-based mechanisms that many EJ organizations um, uh, uh, struggle with. And I know I, I've, I've probably been guilty of just emphasizing the emissions reduction part. I've been you know, on this for a while now <laughs> and, and I should talk about other areas. Um, and one thing I'll say is that in this era of social justice, I'm not sure we wanna be at a point where the main climate change mitigation policy used is one, you know, the rationales, I understand it for, uh, for market-based mechanisms to fight climate change is that they will minimize the cost of the reductions, right? So you minimize costs while you're fighting climate change. At this point, I will argue to us, it's been true at all points, but I think we're recognizing it more. I think we need an overall system to fight climate change mitigation policy that while it's delivering emissions reductions, it minimizes the loss of life, not cost. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't take, in, take in cost into account, that that should be a factor, but it should be a constraint. It shouldn't be something we're trying to minimize or maximize however, however you look at it. And if you talk to our indigenous um, members of, um, of the um, EJ movement, they really uh, emphasize, they don't like the commodification of the environment that market-based mechanism bring. Um, so I will say do a minute, since I am at 31 and a half minutes on um, a recent initiative that you may have heard of because Massachusetts, I think, is one of the few states to join. And it's called the Transportation and Climate Initiative. Now, Reggie, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, focuses on the power generation sector. The Transportation and Climate Initiative focuses on uh, greenhouse gas emissions from mobile sources. And the EJ community is down with this. We definitely need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from mobile sources. But again, what we're looking for is the counterpart in the transportation sector to the policy I just delivered to you. We want to develop policies for the transportation sector that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and at the same time guarantee emissions reductions in EJ communities. And the Transportation and Climate Initiative does not do this because what is at its core, the core policy, you might have guessed it. Uh, this quote is from TCI. And it says cap and invest program or other pricing mechanism is a carbon trading system at its core. And so EJ communities across the Northeast have opposed TCI. Um, and a large part of the reason is because of this carbon trading system at its core that will not guarantee emissions reductions in EJ communities. Um, I want to mention before I stop that I did write a paper about this. Um, in 2017. If you want some late night reading, it will put you to sleep. Please read it. Um, a more recent paper uh, uh, by one of your colleagues, um, um, Michael Ash, Jim Boyce, and I'm going to mess up her name. I think it's Diana Riddick, uh, make very similar argu arguments and really kind of extend the argument. So I, I, I will commend both of these um, for you to read. And I will close out by saying that. I, I, and I'll do that in this case, I normally issue a challenge at the end of my talk. And here's the challenge. Many people, many organizations say that um, environmental justice and equity are priorities for them, right? Environmental organizations will say that, um, policy, environmental policymakers will say that. Well, here's the challenge. If that is true, then make obtaining the emissions reduction for EJ communities through climate change mitigation policy as important as obtaining greenhouse gas reduction. And be careful if you make that commitment 
Because what the EJ community is saying is that if you have a climate change mitigation policy that does not guarantee emissions reductions in EJ communities, we should not use that policy. So if you accept this challenge and accept that we gotta make these reductions in EJ communities as important as uh, obtaining greenhouse gas reductions, I think you'll make the little girl you see in that picture who's a member of an EJ community happier than she appears to be at the moment that picture is taken. So I'm gonna stop there. And David, I'll turn it back to you. I'll stop share. And I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, it's really, really, there's so much there. Um, and I'm, I, I learned a lot as well, so thank you. Um, yes, so the floor is open. I, I meant to say before introducing um, the talk that you know the usual rule for this is uh, please post in the chat that you want to ask a question or ask your question in the chat, and then I, I will get to you. And I see um, already Nathan has a question, so go ahead, Nathan. Hi, Dr. Sheets. Thanks for the uh, presentation. I had a question on one of the points you brought up, which is like um, one of the challenges in studying this is understanding how we even define an EJ community in the first place. I'm wondering if kind of from your experiences, you have kind of guidance for how analysts should be thinking about this. Should we be thinking what spatial scale at the county level, at the municipal level, something smaller than that? And kind of what are the kind of statistics or other characteristics you're looking for in trying to define that? So this is uh, going on right now. We are doing some thinking about it. Um, one of the coalitions, which I don't think I had down there, uh, that we're a part of is called the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform that actually brings together uh, green groups and EJ groups. And we have a policy working group of which I'm one of the co-chairs that's thinking about this problem. Um, in New Jersey, our law, our law, the law actually defines what it calls overburdened communities, but they're actually uh, EJ communities. So several things. We're talking about it on the scale of, of usually a census block group, which goes into making up a census tract. So the figures I showed you were on the level of a census block group. And uh, what we're thinking, and we're gonna come out with this publicly from the Equitable and Just National Platform, um, is something very similar to what the law in New Jersey does. Uh, cutoffs for race and income. So the law in New Jersey says that if a census block group is um, at least 40% of color or 35% low income, which means twice the federal poverty rate, or it, it also uses linguistic isolation or 40% linguistic, um, I'm saying it wrong, or 40% of this resident are linguistically isolated, then it is an EJ community. And let me draw a distinction for you between EJ communities and overburdened communities, right? There's gonna be a lot of overlap, but when we say EJ communities, we, we, we suggest to find those communities only by race and income, because not all EJ communities are gonna be overburdened, but we argue they're gonna be more vulnerable to becoming overburdened, and, and, they, and they are more susceptible to whatever pollution is there already in the future air, uh, in the future air pollution, or in all types of pollution. So we wanna protect these EJ communities, even if they're not overburdened now, because they're more vulnerable. And then with overburdened communities, you add in some type of um, pollution indicator. So look at Cal Enviro screen, and it has pollution indicators to deal with exposure and with um, environmental, environmental hazards. So a lot of that I think is going on now. Um, I'll draw attention to, and, and um, I've written a paper, uh, 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 um, and a, um, a close colleague and I hope to publish it soon on cumulative impacts, where we talk about this a little bit, and we're probably gonna talk about it in more detail in, in, a, in another paper. Uh, one of the issues we gotta decide is race, because I will say, I, I almost hate to talk about it because I don't want to discourage people from using race, but we just have to acknowledge that using race in the definition of EJ communities may invite some um, legal, may invite some lawsuits. That's not to say we shouldn't use it, but that is to say we need to think it through and be prepared. Thanks, Gregor has a question. Um, yeah, hi, um, thanks very much for this um, enlightening talk. Um, 
I wrote my question in the chat. I'm just going to read it um, to keep it to that length. Uh, with regards to the TCI, um, can you speak to discussions in the EJ community about the problem that is overall gasoline and fuel prices um, uh, rise because of the caps? Mm -hmm. uh, it is the less affluent groups and hence EJ communities that may find it hardest to pay for the investment in an electric vehicle or have the least access to public transport alternatives. Yeah. Um, this argument also applies more generally to carbon prices. To what if, extent, if any, are fee baits and carbon dividends supported by these communities and their advocates? Um, well, um, yeah, the, the carbon tax has a more varied history in the EJ community, um, which <laughs> well, part, partly because when 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 uh, when we kind of first came on the scene in climate change mitigation policy, everybody was talking about a carbon trading, and you could not. And this was back in 2007, 2008. You could not talk about regulation. So we actually formed a national EJ organization to address, this was back in 2007, eight. So we've been talking about the co-pollutants for a while now. My, 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 my Nick, one of my nicknames nationally in the EJ community is Nikki Co-Pollutant Sheets, because we've talked about this, you know, we brought this um, question you know, up for a long time. Um, and at the time, we actually came out in support of a carbon tax because we thought, well, we'll be in on the ground floor and we can make sure that it addresses the emissions reductions. Now, you know, I hate to characterize the entire EJ community, but in New Jersey, now that regulations are more possible, in New Jersey, we oppose a carbon tax and carbon dividend, all of that. Um, you know, we say, look, we really prefer regulations. If we can get regulations, and we can't stop a market-based system, then we, you know, say, and we walk a fine line, right? Then we say, well, incorporate this proposal that, that I've talked about. Now, look, other EJ organizations, and that's why EJ is a local issue, and we support other local EJ organizations that may find themselves in different political settings, and they may make the decision where we're going to support a carbon tax for whatever reason, maybe as a lesser of an evil, but you know they evaluate their own political situation and and they and they make a choice. But I think there, I will say, there's broad skepticism of um, pure market-based mechanisms in the EJ community. Uh, pretty much everybody's against the carbon trading, uh, carbon tax. You know, it may not be as monolithic, but you know, people are thinking about this and have these have these issues. Maybe different ways to solve it. Uh, we don't usually focus on. And here's a difference in the EJ community. And a lot of people supporting um, market-based mechanisms. Uh, you know, we we we're, we're not as focused on 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 the economic hardship um, within climate change mitigation policy. What we say is that look, and and, and most of the studies I've shown that have the they're going to give a dividend back. The dividend is fairly modest, um, and you know we're really focused on the public health issue. As, as you know, EJ really boils down to public health. And what we've been saying, and this has been a fight all along about market-based mechanism, not just with a carbon tax. What the big green groups that have supported, I guess I didn't say that, right? The environmental community by and large supports carbon trading and market-based mechanisms. And the EJ community by and large does not. And that's caused a big fight, you know, big division between the environmental community and the EJ community. Right from the beginning, what the environmental group said was, well, we'll take the money generated by cap and trade, and we'll use that money to, re to invest in EJ communities. And you know, even from the beginning, the EJ community said, that's why I went into the whole thing about, you know, you got to integrate EJ up front. Then we said, look, that's just not good enough. You know, taking the money and being promised something later um, is just not good enough for us. And, and, you know, <laughs> I used to wouldn't say this, but as I get older, I'm like, shoot, I'm gonna die soon anyway, I might as well say it. Um, people of color have heard that before. You know, we heard that about slavery, right? We heard that about, uh, in the 1960s, I remember reading a book where uh, the Kennedys apparently came to Martin Luther King and they said, well, please don't do all this marching now because we're in the middle of a cold war and you're making us look bad. The Russians will win the Cold War because you're raising all these racial issues. You know, March later, of course, you know, civil rights movement said no. And, and it's kind of the same thing. 
uh, this promise of later is just, it's just not good enough. And we're, we're going through that in New Jersey, by the way, with the money from Reggie. I don't know what's happening in Massachusetts, but um, you know, and they're starting to develop programs, but still we're asking, you know, what are the programs? What communities will they serve? How much money will be invested in them? How many, you know, what will be the reductions? When will the reductions occur? We don't have answers to any of that yet, but Reggie's been going on for years. Thanks. Um, so the, the, um, the questions are starting to pile up. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you to, uh, I'm gonna ask the three questions that I see to just be directed at you kind of one after the other, and then you can, maybe you can respond to all three. And I see, um, I actually had one myself, but I, I will defer. So uh, there's one from Stephen Fernandez, followed by um, one by my newly UMass tenured colleague, um, uh, Professor Thad Miller, and then there's one, oh, there's a couple more. There's one from Adrian um, Nunez and Jenny Chen. So there's four questions, if you don't mind taking them sure. after they, okay, go I ahead. Be over a few minutes, David. If, if people sure, we appreciate people. that. Yeah. Thanks. But well, people please leave when they're ready to, right? Don't want to hold people hostage. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm supposed yeah, so go ahead. Okay, my, my question was about um, how do we incorporate uh, marginalized and vulnerable communities that are not in the United States? And, um, you know, particularly I'm thinking of um, there's indigenous communities in Canada that are very detrimentally impacted by uh, fracking and other um, fossil fuel extraction that is for uh, U.S. power generation. Even uh, solar energy plants now are using high density uh, lithium batteries. And lithium is obtained, uh, a lot of it is obtained from South America, and again, is exploitation of indigenous communities. So to, how can we incorporate uh, these communities into the, um, uh, was it environmental justice communities? Great, and go ahead then, just ask your questions if, um, uh, with, with Dr. Sheets' indulgence, uh, Thad, Adrian, and Jenny. Great. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sheets. That was a great presentation. Um, my question is, I'd, I'd just be really curious to hear your take on the rapid emergence of uh, discussions around just transitions and whether it's around decarbonization of the economy and that the, you know those energy transitions need to be just. I think even Biden's administration has been using that uh, terminology, and I know, you know, also coal communities have been, you know, urging President Biden to think about just transitions as they, uh, as they uh, increase policy activity around uh, decarbonization. And so really curious to see from your perspective and the EJ community, um, you know, how, how you're, what, what you're seeing as the kind of plus sides to, to that, um, as well as maybe I'm sure some of the issues that that might gloss over that have been, you know, uh, been in the EJ community for, for decades. Hi, I'm Adrian. Thank you so much. Um, my question might be a bit of a stretch from what you're directly from your talk, um, but I have an interest in current use tax programs and in particular their role in um, climate change mitigation and uh, what can be done to ensure um, that we are paying attention to environmental justice factors um, and racial and economic equity. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that level of sort of market-based incentive program um, or any recommended sort of reading or folks to look at related to that. Thank you. Should I go, David? We've got one more question, if you don't mind, Nikki, thanks. Hey, Dr. Sheets, thank you for sharing with us the EJ movement and allowing and you, you asked for allowing UCR students to join in on the discussion. So my question is, how do advocates for the EJ movement handle political pushback for, community, for EJ communities when data shows that they are most vulnerable to carbon dioxide emissions? Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. You can now go ahead. OK. Thanks for um, So the first one was, how do we incorporate um, indigenous communities in EJ? Um, so on the national level, we've done that pretty well. You heard me refer to the IEN, Indigenous Environmental Network, a very influential, uh, very influential group and are a part of, um, uh, we have several national EJ coalitions 
and a part of those, uh, for the most part, part of those DJ coalitions. And they, and they brought to the table this, uh, I, I will say, more holistic view of the environment. And as I said before, they, they, they usually bring up um, the commodification of the environment. That's one of the, one of the reasons why they are against carbon trading. You know, besides the emissions reduction to some basic level, they say the atmosphere should not be treated as a commodity to be sold or, um, you know, bargained or, or, or are traded. I think to be um, somewhat self-critical in New Jersey, we have not done as good a job. There is, um, most of the EJ communities in New Jersey are in urban areas, but there is a Ramapo Indian nation up in North Jersey. It has suffered a, a big EJ issue. When we're in contact, and, but not, not as much as we should be. And we're, we're trying to work on that in New Jersey, but nationally pretty well integrated. You can look up I IEN, Indigenous Environmental Network, and, and see their work heavily involved in the, um, in the, in the pipeline, right, out, out west, which you probably uh, heard about. Um, just transition, I'm gonna punt a little bit because I, I don't do those issues. Um, I would suggest looking at the Just Transition Alliance um, to look at those issues. I, I will say that um, one of the successes of the EJ movement has been moving EJ in general and EJ issues from the margins of environmental policy making discussions to the mainstream. And, um, you know, for the last half decade or so, EJ has really become a sexy issue. And um, everybody and their mother and father want to do EJ. And in a way, that's good because we need the support, we need the interest, but it also presents a threat because organizations and institutions, and I'm including universities here, and I work at a university, right? So it's <laughs> almost self-critical here. Um, uh, organizations, institutions with more resources, both money and people, with more name recognition, and, and frankly, I'll just say it, and, and that are whiter, and I still think white folks um, in our society are um, paid more attention to, um, and the threat is that the EJ organizations will be marginalized in our own space. And who comes to define EJ? Um, uh, you know, who says what the EJ issue is and what the solutions are? And as these other organizations move into that space, take Just Transition Alliance. Who's gonna say what an authentic solution is to Just Transition Alliance? Is it gonna be the EJ groups that have been traditionally working with EJ, um, EJ, uh, um, residential communities, or is it going to be new groups moving into that space and may want to define it very differently? And, um, and I've heard my colleagues complain about this from a Just Transition Alliance point of view. <laughs> I've heard them complain, but since I don't do it, I'm not exactly sure how. But I can give you uh, an example in emissions reductions that drive us nuts. We are against incineration, and now the, the owner of the two biggest incinera incinerators in Newark, in New Jersey, or call themselves environmental justice facilities. And you can imagine our reaction to that. Um, and so, you know, so we worry, worry about that. And I think that would be an issue in Just Transition. So Just Transition Alliance, if you go to their website, um, they've been around for a long time and I'm sure they have materials there. Uh, current use tax. Uh, Adrian, would you, I'm sorry, I'm going to show my ignorance. Define a current use tax for me, please. Sure. There are significant reductions in property tax um, for large swaths of the land in Massachusetts. It's large, large swaths of forest land of 10 contiguous acres or more. It's also um, a large reduction in property tax generally for agriculture. Um, so in Massachusetts, the law was first started back in 1912, and I believe it was to help in stopping with clear cutting. Um, things that come to mind for me are sort of, well, out here in Massachusetts, especially in this particular region, it's predominantly white, and these programs seem to hold land wealth within uh, families. 
um, help to maintain um, land wealth within families, which therefore means white wealth and land um, ownership out here. Um, as well, I am curious about the idea of sort of carbon sink trading. Mm. So there's all these things that kind of come to mind and I, um, I'm, I'm curious about how we can use these tools, but make sure that we are not ignoring equity issues and perhaps use them um, in reparations. So um, I, 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 the quick answer is I don't know. You, 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 I haven't thought about you know, property tax. Uh, you hit a little nerve when you say a carbon sink trading because um, you know, I, I imagine that's that I, I imagine the argument is going to be that whatever forestation or green green materials on those lands are going to act as a sink for um, carbon carbon dioxide. So you know, uh, the trading uh, always gets our attention because uh, you know you may we we want the reductions at a particular location, and if you can do the trading and get credit. For and not reduce you know, where you're at. And that's an EJ community, that's a problem. I don't know if that would be a problem in, in the context of uh, current use, you know, current use taxes or property. Another big problem, and again, I, I, this is international, uh, it's called RED, where I guess large portions of forested land have been protected because they're being used as sinks and then the local population can't use them. I, again, I don't do international international issues, but, but those are a couple of issues that pop to mind, so I can't be more helpful, helpful there. So now I'll look out for it though. <laughs> I'll ask around. And I think the last question was, uh, how do we deal with political pushback? Um, you know, I, I, I think well, one, one thing I've learned, um, we, we, we've been at this a while now when um, uh, we, we first started again, we first started our national organ, one national organization called the e EJ Leadership Forum on Climate Change. That was just the EJ Leadership Forum. We started back in 2008, specifically to address climate change and specifically really to address the carbon trading problem. And you know we were talking about the coal pollutants there and we were talking about getting the local reductions, you know, then. That was the issue that all of us were talking about. In New Jersey, we were talking about it more because we were working on local air pollution when we first started our organization. That's how we came onto the scene. So we were really on that local air pollution problem, you know, right, right from the beginning. And I gotta tell you, back in 2008, there was the, uh, oh, Marky, was it Marky Waxman? There was a national carbon trading bill that was being proposed. And uh, all the environmental groups were for it. And the EJ groups were, you know, against it. Reggie was just was just being initiated. And and in, in, you know, we were just starting to talk about we were we were coming on the national scene and starting to talk about these issues and placing public health and local air pollution right in the middle of it. And it was not pretty. <laughs> we were, uh, as I say, there was a bitter divide between the environmental groups and EJ groups. And it was fairly bitter. So much so that I couldn't even write a paper with an environmental group. Because, you know, EJ folks would be, would be mad at me. That's how big the divide was. And frankly, we were losing. Um, but we kept at it, you know, and, and then the clean power plan came and, uh, that was back in 2014 and the clean power plan was a national, um, response from EPA to climate change, you know, long awaited rule. And it was a carbon trading system. And so we worked on that. The, the paper I, I did, I, that I wrote in 2017 was really around, probably around the clean power plan. You know, in general, it was around carbon trading, but probably around the clean power plan. And so we were still fighting it. Now, this is the next iteration where this idea is starting to gain some traction. Um, we haven't seen policy around it yet, 
but we're pushing it in New Jersey. Um, um, you know, more people are talking about it. Um, your colleague, Michael Ash, you know, <laughs> is, uh, is taking it to another level, frankly. And, and I think it's going to be, you know, is going to be part of, uh, I hope, of the solution, you, you, you know, that, that comes about. And one thing I have learned is, uh, and, and I'll say cumulative impacts too. And, and the victory in cumulative impacts is not a victory yet, but the big step forward by our legislation was unexpected. And I'll say one thing I've learned is, boy, we're just sticking in there. You know, we just, we haven't gone away. And I, you know, I, I mean, I'm to the point and I was to the point where I was pretty sure I was gonna die without these issues being addressed. But I was ready to just pass it on to the next generation. You know, it's, it's almost like leaving in the afterlife. Like, like you, just, you just believe that you're part of, what's the famous saying from Martin Luther King? The arc of justice, you, you know that, right? You know, that you're part of this big movement that eventually you'll get there. You may not see it. And, and so I've learned that lesson now that we just have to, man, we gotta be patient. Um, and, um, you know, we just, and we, and we just hang in there. And, and as I grow to near the end of my career, I'm also looking to young people like you, Jenny. Jen, you asked that, didn't you? Yeah, the, you know, that becomes more important to me now, you know, to, to, to pass things on and work with, work with young people, um, you know, work more with young people. Cause I realized that, that um, you're going to solve some problems that you know a lot of problems that that uh, we're going to be left with. Thanks. I don't know if that answers it. And so that, that, now let me give you a more concrete answer. Besides, have faith. One thing we're doing in New Jersey is we are turning to we're trying to, but we don't have a lot of capacity. Our ours is a staff of two, the New Jersey EJ Alliance, and then the board does a lot of work. So like myself and Ana Baptista, my colleague, we're basically the policy arm of the New Jersey EJ Alliance, right? That's, that's basically where we are. But we're reaching out to of color social justice organizations that don't normally do EJ and try to get their consistent report support. We've done that sporadically in the past, but we figure we gotta go beyond the environmental groups and stop just trying to convince them. Let's go to other groups that work with people in our communities. So let you know how that turns out. Thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, I mean, thanks to everybody who, who has been here um, and who is still here for, for being part of this kind of, you know, ongoing um, thinking through issues and hopefully handing them off to, to those of you who can really continue to, to, to do well. But, but again, I wanna thank our speaker, um, Dr. Nikki Sheets, um, and uh, wish everybody a great end of the semester and end of the school year. And, you know, um, SPP hopes to see everybody back for whatever we do next year on this. So thanks again. Be well, everybody. Thanks, everybody.